Welcome to the Tropical Fish Keeping Podcast. My name is Ruth, and today we're going to look at a bit of a species spotlight. Are we going to look at some rare and exotic and impressive fish that no one's ever heard of? Well, I might be saying that if we were back in the 1930s. Instead, let's look at a real aquarium favourite that in many ways is a victim of its own popularity, the Neon Tetra. Why have I chosen that one, you might be asking. There are more rare and exotic, exciting fish out there. I think I've got a a distinct soft spot for the neon. It's a misunderstood little fish. Nowadays, you're very likely to find ones that are suffering from neon tetra disease, which is actually, interestingly, a type of very, very simplistic fungus. Sadly, it won't. It, it, you can't treat it with antifungals, which would be ideal. It's only been found that the overall parasite, well, not parasite, the overall disease cause of it is um, microsporidius, and that has DNA shown that, that, that that's actually a type of fungus. Neons have gone a huge way to bringing us to the hobby we have today. And they really are a fish that changed how very early acarus kept water. Even before then, in the pre-World War I years and in the interwar years, fish keeping was becoming a really building hobby, shall we say. We have fish keeping books back from about the 1750s, showing that fish keeping was quite popular in England, definitely through and into the 19th century and the late 19th century especially. There are wonderful books like um, Home Furnishings, which have a reasonably good detailed description of how best to set a tank up for the time. The issue is that people didn't understand about pH. Well, they understood pH in the abstract, but not how it impacted us in tanks. They didn't have any way of providing clean, fresh, safe water. So old aquarium water was the the, the be-all and end-all, especially once we see chlorination in municipal water in, in, uh, in water taps. In the 1930s, there was a butterfly collector wandering around the various parts of the Amazon where the Neon Tetra is found. Didn't have any real clue about fish, but it was pointed out to him this really bright coloured little fish. It's a silvery fish with a red and blue stripe. If you've seen Cardinal Tetras, you can tell the difference. They've got slightly less. The stripes don't extend the full length of the body. But they are amazingly beautiful little fish. And this butterfly collector managed to get 13 neons alive back to Paris. But they came into the hands of a guy called Neil, and he invented the name Neon Fish. He then sold them, and this is in the 1930s, for six and a half thousand dollars to Schnell and Grimm in Hamburg, two Germans. And that was in 1935. In 1936, so still over 80 years ago we're talking about here, five of these fish were dispatched on the Hindenburg. Now, crucially, she didn't manage to crash till the following year. Problem was, they weren't actually allowed to transport live animals on the Hindenburg, so they, they snuck them aboard as fish preserves. And only one of them made the trip alive. The other four were sadly dead when they got to the other end. It cost $3,000 to transport those fish. Um, they That one fish that made it was absolutely a, a, a little miniature celebrity. Because it was, I presumably, it was being described as the last of its kind. And it was, it was really impressive. And if you've never seen aquarium fish before, and all of a sudden you're presented with this little silver, shiny, red and blue fish, it must have been amazing. The thing was, with these fish selling for, as I said, $6,500 in the 1930s, I don't know if any of you have got parents like mine who were describing how houses, you could buy a house for, you know, 
ten pound and a packet of chips or something. Um, very much what my parents describe house buying like. Imagine how much property you could have purchased in in 1930 for six and a half thousand dollars, um, and what it would be worth today. So, as with even today, when new species are found and new species become popular, there is a race to find more. And I will be the first to say that can lead to overfishing. Um, celestial pendanios is a good example. They were found, and then next thing you know, everybody wanted them. Um, they were found to be able to be bred pretty quickly. Uh, an aquarium local to me, Bolton Aquarium, bred them quite rapidly. But that was the difference with Neon Tetris. Despite the fact more were brought in because it was eventually found where they they um, where this first group had been collected from, they brought them in and they started trying to breed them. They got them to spawn, they got them to lay the eggs, but they were missing several key factors. The first being that Neon Tetris disease I was talking about. It's very, very easy to kill off the entire spawn with Neon Tetris disease, which can be reintroduced, any of these uh, microsporidias that can be reintroduced into the water. Um, you have to even be careful with washing your hands and things like that. But also uh, columnaris, also called false neon tetra disease in this scenario, that can kill anything off. But you weren't even getting to that stage. Neon tetras come from a very specific habitat. And I'll talk about that again towards the end in sort of ideas for setting up a neon tetra um, tank. They come from black water. They don't come from any other white water streams. And what do I mean by black water? I mean all that water in that stream has gone through peat and the rainforest floor, which is mounds and mounds of leaves and organics. They've built up that tannic and humic acids in there. If you take a glass of water out, it looks um, like maybe weak cola, that sort of colour, or strong tea. It's really thick and black, but it's clear. I'm sorry, it's black, but it's clear. It, it doesn't look um dirty is so much it's just got a very very dark color the same way like i said if you hold up um a fruit juice to the light you can see there's a tint of color to the water but you can still see through the water that makes any rambling sense the water where neons is found is so soft that the ph can be as low as four and unlike a lot of other tropical fish they don't appreciate very high temperatures Interestingly enough, if you raise neon tetras today in water with really any calcium in it, it actually inhibits a gonad development. So they, they don't actually develop correctly in hard water. And even moderately hard water there, it doesn't have to be very much at all. So to actually breed neons, and we know this now, if you're breeding neons, you need a separate tank for the eggs, otherwise they get eaten. A way that the eggs can fall through, either through uh, mesh or into marbles is a good idea. So cover the base with marbles and allow them to fall through. The eggs are light sensitive. And this is from evolving in an area in that very dark peat stained water where the light wouldn't really reach the bottom. Also, probably the parents are spawning of a night when they're less likely to be eaten. They need that very, very soft acidic water. I mean, I start with RO water and then I add acids instead of buffering up with um, your calciums to make it more basic, more alkaline. I actually add acids to my neon water. And they need relatively low temperatures, spawning temperatures in sort of 23, 24 degrees C. And I actually keep my neon tetras at the 20s, sort of very high teens, low 20s when I'm keeping them. Absolutely great for your electricity bill, by the way, guys. And also, like I say, they have to be kept dark, very, very clean water. So you finally got them to hatch. What's the next problem? Very, very clean water. And this is in a time where, because, I mean, even still today, we get people go, oh, you mustn't do more than 25% water change every two weeks. Rubbish. And Neon Tetras were the ones that really showed us that they can be so te temperamental with things like bacteria and other microorganisms. And the only way to keep on top of that is just constant clean water. And you do this by decent water changes relatively frequently. It's this sort of thing that has now led us to find out that more and more species need these conditions and how now today we've reached a point in fish keeping where 
it, it's it's normal to be doing large regular water changes. I wouldn't do less than 50% a week. Um, and I know a lot of people who are sort of over that way with me. So the Neon Tetra is now in the hobby. It's now spawning. Most of the fish you get nowadays are actually um, farm bred. Would I say you shouldn't get wild neon caught tetras? If you can get wild and they're sustainably caught, I would grab them. I would snap them up tomorrow. Much healthier fish, much better looking. Now, how would I go about keeping neon tetras? They're quite an active fish. Don't think you can get a 60 liter tank and keep them. I would really advise nothing less than 100, 120 liters. If you're talking about what would I go for, I can tell you what I'm setting up right now. So the tank I'm looking at is 120 centimeters, about four foot long. It's about 40 centimeters tall and it's 30 centimeters front to back. It's going to have um, an, a, a soily sort of base to make sure I'm getting plenty of acids in. And I'm probably going to use an aquarium soil that leaches to allow that. I'm not going to be putting much in the way of plants in because they don't appreciate that incredibly low pH. I'll also get botanicals like alder cones and I will actively boil them up to get the tannic acid out. Before I even think of adding fish, I'll be adding that to the water. I'll make sure I've got that deep, rich tannin stained. I will have leaf litter across the bottom. Not only does leaf litter give the fish somewhere to hide and just gives it a more natural appearance, as the leaves start to decay, it starts to, the decomposition, things come to feed on it. And you actually get stuff so that if they do spawn in the tank, very unlikely, but it gives the fry something to pick at. And it just makes it all in all more natural. I'll probably have twigs coming down at the back. They don't live in rocky areas by any means. So I'll have sort of a jumble of twigs at the back and give them places to hide. And I'll probably have a shoal of 25 or 30 in that. And I'm unlikely to have very much else in there. I think they can be a real feature of the tank. Saying that, if I find the perfect thing to go in with them, great. I'll probably aim to have the pH at about between 4.8 and 5.2. I'll keep it relatively stable. But the crucial thing is I'm giving myself that wriggle room when I set it up. It's nothing worse than saying I will definitely hit 4.8. And the tank settles out at five and just sits there and resists all opportunities to change. So I'll set it up like that. Quite dim, low lighting, and the fish will really start to pop and show their colour and act more natural. At the lower pH, they are healthier and they can resist neon tetra disease much, much better. Now, there's two big issues I've now got with this. The first issue is that your standard aquarium filter cycle will not work at that lower pH. And bioreactor filters, the ones that claim an instant cycle, because the water's so soft, they've got nothing to exchange, so they won't work either. But here's the thing. Ammonia doesn't exist at that lower pH. It's all locked up as ammonium, and that's much, much safer. But it still needs changing out. And I won't be able to change it out using standard tap water because even the lowest pH tap water still sits above six. If I did that, I'd cause all sorts of nightmares every time I change the water. So what will I be doing? I'll be using RO water, reverse osmosis water with absolutely nothing in it. I will then be adding acids and getting it to within 0 0.05 of the pH of the tank before I do a water change. And I'll probably be doing about 25%. I'll aim for every day, but if stuff comes up every other day, it'll be fine for me. What this means is it can be quite a labor-intensive tank. But seeing neons in the real, the, the natural habitat or more natural habit is more than worth it. I may consider spawning them. And how I'll do that is I'll have a small tank nearby I will get some ADA, the plastic ADA for um, cross-stitch patterns, get the, one of the wider things of that, and I'll put that across the bottom of the tank and wedge it in so it sort of makes an arch. I'll condition them up, and when I see males and females that are nice and conditioned, I'll be conditioning them with a lot of live foods, um, so I grow with going on daff. This time of year where I am in the Northern Hemisphere in summer, there's mosquito larvae everywhere. 
using a lot of that sort of thing. I won't be using a lot of dried foods for them. Uh, just they appreciate it. I can, especially over winter when my live food cultures do. Um, I will fall back on it, but I try and feed live as much as I can. Also things like fruit flies on the surface, they're not above nipping up and picking them off just like they would in the wild. Separate them off. Um, and again, crucially, that water is going to have to be the same as the tank water. Hopefully they'll spawn, the eggs will fall through, and then I can move the parents back into the main tank. And then it'll just be a case of waiting for the fry to hatch. And I'll be feeding them on things like vinegar eels, um, moving through like banana worm, micro worm, things like that. Tiny, tiny fry food as they grow up. And hopefully I can do it that way. And I think that'll be a nice little project, nice and fun. But even if you're not into the breeding side, it's an absolutely fantastic setup to have. Like I say, a little bit more labor intensive. You don't have to go as low in the pH as I have. But what it means is you get to see a lovely little fish that's readily available and heavily overlooked by people suddenly start to show their absolutely stunning colours and their personality. And you get to see sort of males and females chasing each other and flirting and things like that. And start to, I think, just enjoy a real jewel of the aquarium that I think so often we forget. <laughs>